Let's pray. Gracious God, good to be here in worship, Lord. Thank you so much for the, what we've experienced this morning in, in worship and how we felt your presence here. And now we ask, Lord, that you would speak to us through your word. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness to do that. Every time we open the scriptures, every time we ask you to speak by your Holy Spirit to our hearts, do it again, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All of God's people have the opportunity to walk through the wilderness. It's an experience that we share together. You might think of um, a long chain of God's people walking through the desert arm in arm. And as we begin our journey through the desert, we add our, our arms, our hands, and we link our arms with theirs all the way to the beginning of God's work and God's merciful and gracious power in the lives of his people, all of us get to walk through the wilderness. And it's that place where we come to the end of our human resources, and it's where we begin to experience the, the help, the grace, the power of God at a time when we feel the weakest. And this morning, Elijah is going to give us a little tour of his experience through the wilderness that I think we have so much to learn from Elijah. And if you're new to the scriptures, Elijah, one of the great prophets of the Hebrew scriptures of the Old Testament, Elijah gets front and center in some of the best stories in the Bible. <laughs> Elijah has an amazing career with God and uh, is really the last person you'd think of as being ever self-doubting or full of fear. But Elijah's, one of his greatest uh, uh, stories in the Bible has to do with a time when he confronts the prophets of Baal. These were the foreign gods that uh, Ahab and Jezebel, who were the rulers at that time, introduced into Israel and thought, well, it would be a good idea to put uh, these altars to Baal next to the altars to Yahweh because it'll sort of hedge our bets. These are the local, this was the local God, and they thought, well, if we, uh, if we give a little space to Baal, maybe it will also, maybe our crops will grow a little faster, we'll get a little bit more rain, things will go a little bit better for us. And uh, so that was, the, that was the theory behind the whole idea. Well, Elijah begged to differ. And we assume God begged to differ as well. And so Elijah challenges the prophets of Baal, and there were 850 at the time, to a contest on Mount Carmel. At this point, all the priests of Yahweh, of the, of the living God, have been killed by Jezebel and Ahab. So he challenges them to a contest on Mount Carmel, up in the northern part of Israel, not too far from the Sea of Galilee. Actually, it overlooks the Mediterranean Sea. Quite a spectacular location. And at that place, Elijah builds an altar. And he proposes this challenge. He says, let us pray and call upon our respective gods and see which one answers by fire. And so the 850 prophets of Baal begin to pray and scream and chant and cut themselves with knives and they do that for hours and hours and hours and nothing happens. And then Elijah says, okay, now it's my turn. I want you to drench the altar with water. Get a five-gallon bucket, pour it over there and they do it. Do it again, he says. Do it again until the entire altar is just completely drenched with water and there's a, there's a pool around it sopping wet, and he calls upon the Lord, and fire comes down from heaven and consumes the offering and licks up all the water. And the prophets of Baal end up dead. Now, that was the context of what happened next, which was that Jezebel basically said, that was not a good idea, Elijah. I'm going to treat you exactly the way you treated these prophets of Baal, and you will be dead within 24 hours. And then we read these amazing words that Elijah was afraid. 
The last person you think of who would be afraid was Elijah, especially after that experience of God's incredible power. So let's read on. Let's read how this story progresses and how Elijah ends up in the wilderness in deep fear of his life. 1 Kings chapter 19, beginning with verse 3. Then Elijah was afraid. He got up and he fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servant there. But Elijah himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. We'll get back to that. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. And then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. Elijah looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him, and said, Get up and eat, or the journey will be too much for you. Elijah got up and ate and drank, and then he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. At that place he came to a cave, and he spent the night there. And then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant. They throw down your altars. They've killed your prophets with a sword, and I alone am left. And they are seeking my life to take it away. And God said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. And then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What can we learn from Elijah about passing through the wilderness? Well, we can learn a lot. But here are just a few things. First of all, we are not condemned. When we're passing through the wilderness, we're not condemned. God knows that the journey is too much for us. You know, it's it's somewhat encouraging to know that Elijah can be afraid. Because if Elijah can be afraid, it's okay for us to be afraid. It's okay for us to feel overwhelmed, to be filled with dread and discouragement and even despair at times, and at the very same moment be a person of God. That was Elijah. And it may surprise us. It may shake us a little bit. But the Bible has no problem talking about the fallibility of of some of the Bible's most faith-filled people. Elijah feels that his confrontation with the priests of Baal in an effort to turn Israel back to God has completely failed. And as we know, uh, Ahab and Jezebel threaten uh, Elijah to take away his life. And so he's, he's, he's fleeing into the desert. He's fleeing for fear of his own life. And it's good to remember that God knows what we are up against. And I love this phrase where the angel touches Elijah and says, get up and eat. He said, the journey is too much for you if you don't. The journey is too much. And sometimes it just feels that way doesn't it? 
sometimes it feels we come to the end of our limits and we feel this journey that I'm on right now is just too much. And isn't it good to know that here in this place, God says to Elijah, I, I get that. I, I understand this is too much. It's too much. You can't do it on your own. Get up, Elijah. Get up and eat. I love Psalm 104, which reads, As a father has compassion for his children, listen to this, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. For he knows how we were made. He remembers that we are dust. He remembers that we are dust. Out of the dust we were formed. And God blessed the dust. <laughs> and we are dusty. And it's by God's grace that this dust speaks and walks and talks. Because his spirit lives in us. You know, it's sad, but sometimes those who feel severely depressed or suffer from low feelings have been told that it's their fault, even in the church. And sometimes they've heard the message that's not true, that if they just prayed a little bit more, if they had more faith, then they wouldn't have these feelings. So it's really a spiritual problem, and it's your problem. Your problem is you don't have enough faith, and that's why you are experiencing these feelings. But the truth is, and the scriptures bear this out right here very powerfully, we are simply human. And there are times when God has to remind us that the journey can feel at times like it's just too much. Because it is too much. We can't get out of this world apart from the grace and the power of God, right? We suffer blows that set us back. And you know, we need people to come alongside us. I have to say, Lisa, who's a, a, a therapist, and I, who I am a pastor, both of us have spiritual directors who spend a lot of time just listening to us. <laughs> just listening. And yes, they give some advice. But they spend a lot of time listening. And I'm sure you have you have friends, you have companions on the wilderness road that have blessed you because they've spent time listening and accompanying you and walking with you. And the message that we need to hear is that God doesn't abandon us in our weakness, right? And we don't abandon others in their weakness. Because the journey is a whole lot to do by yourself. So that's the first thing. And secondly, as we walk through the wilderness, let's just say in another way, we have legitimate needs. We have real needs. They're not imaginary. They're real. And God knows that Elijah needs things. Some real basic things that show up in this passage, things like shade, <laughs> things like food, and rest. The first leg of Elijah's journey from Mount Carmel to Beersheba was about a hundred miles. So to go from the Galilee region, basically, on the shore, and down to Beersheba. Remember, that's where Abraham built an altar? You remember that from a couple weeks ago? That's where he uh, builds an altar. And often in the Old Testament, it, it speaks of the Holy Land as the land from Dan in the north to Beersheba. It was a shorthand way of saying the whole inhabited land. Beersheba is kind of the southernmost boundary of habitable land in that region. It's very desolate, but it can be cultivated. What's unique about Beersheba is that there is tremendous water resources underground. That's why Abraham built that well and also bought the well from the local rulers. So there's resources underground that cannot be seen. 
And I'm sure that's one of the reasons why Elijah stopped there. It was for that hidden resource of water and sustenance. But Elijah doesn't stop there. You'd think he would stop there. It's kind of like going to Barstow and stopping at a Motel 6 and saying, no, I'm not going to stop here. I'm going to keep going for another 24 hours on foot into the Mojave Desert. That's what Elijah decides to do. He doesn't stop in Beersheba. That would have been a good, wise move. He continues further south, deeper into what's called the Negev, which is a very severe region of that, that part of the world where the temperature can rise to at least 120 degrees. So no wonder Elijah wants to die. I mean, he, he's got to be uncomfortable. And so he collapses under, the Bible says, a solitary broom tree. Now let me tell you, a broom tree is not much, but it's enough. Can I say that again? A broom tree is not much, but it's enough. It provides just enough shade, maybe to fit underneath it with one person, maybe two. You get a little bit of respite. The broom tree is pretty much the only thing that can survive in the negative. That's a good picture of it right there. And I think about, you know, the way God provides broom trees. And maybe you've, you've experienced that. Maybe you've, you've seen from unexpected places, you've seen a, a, a broom tree. It ain't much, but it's just what, it's what you needed. It got you through. It got you through the next day. It got you through the next week. It was that drop of water. It was that cup of cold water. It was that sustenance. It was that helping friend. It was that little bit of shade in the heat. It was the, is that sign of the grace of God, that God sees me. Man, that's a blessing when that happens. And there are people that are dedicated to providing that just enough shade. I'm thinking about Andy Bales, who was the CEO and the president of Union Rescue Mission that I heard last week. Such an inspiring person, divided, has devoted his life to helping people in the most desperate of situations. I think about our deacons and the ministry that they provide to those who are, who are really in need in our own community and in our own neighborhood. Real practical help for folks who are, have real practical need. Practical needs matter to God. And they should matter to us as well. By the way, did you know that you can actually eat the roots of a broom tree? I'm sure they don't taste very good, but you can actually eat them. And that's what I, I learned this week. I always learn something new in my sermons. You can eat them. But I don't think uh, God said, eat the roots of the broom tree. He actually provided something a little bit better, some cakes and um, some water. So good for Elijah. And then he said, get up and eat. Get up and eat. How many times, have you ever had somebody when you were really feeling bad to say, you need to get up? You need to get up. Remember my mom doing that when I was a kid, and I had been sick for like four days, and I, I don't want to go to school, Mom. You need to get up, get on your bicycle, and ride to, ride, to, ride to class. And I felt so much better by the time I got there. We need people to say, get up and, and eat. Stop and find rest and life-sustaining food in the company of God's people. You and I have been equipped to do that for each other. And thirdly, this. As we walk through the wilderness, we are never alone. God meets Elijah in the sound of sheer silence. This is one of the more famous, well-known passages in the entire Bible. So at this point, Elijah has walked about 360 miles, mostly through the rugged, rugged desert. And he comes to Horeb, which is another, basically another name for Mount Sinai, in the Sinai Peninsula, the mountain of God. And there the Lord speaks to him. And when God appears to Elijah, he does not come, surprisingly, to, he does not come with special effects. There are special effects, but it's very clear that these are, this is not God. God is not in the special effects. God comes out of his cave. He, 
He hears a mighty wind, but God is not in the wind. He feels an earthquaking uh, tremor, but God is not in the earthquake. He sees fire, but God is not in the fire. And then there's the sound of sheer silence. And actually, at this point, we didn't read this. Elijah's back inside of a cave, and when he hears the silence, he comes out of the cave. He's kind of hiding from the earthquake and the wind and the fire. But then the sound of sheer silence draws him back out of the cave, and he hears the voice of God. What are you doing here, Elijah? And I just love this picture of God speaking to us in the silence. We live in a really noisy world of constant stimulation. You know, there's been so much done on the power of silence, so much research on the value, the healing power of silence, how it stimulates the brain, how silence enhances sleep and decreases uh, insomnia, how it promotes self-awareness and reflection and and also the compassionate awareness of the people around us. Silence is very powerful. And uh, I read a little quote by Herman Melville that I love. All profound things are preceded and attended by silence. I love that. All profound things are preceded and attended by silence. By silence. I once hiked to the top of a mountain in the Sinai called Jebel Musa. And it's the traditional site of, of, of Mount Sinai. Obviously, you can't prove the location of Mount Sinai. But I have to tell you, if you've ever been to the Sinai, the Sinai Peninsula, you will be impressed. The mountains there are truly uh, otherworldly. They're very striking in their shape and the power of, of, the, of those mountains. Beautiful and awesome and desolate. And I hiked to the top of that mountain with some friends. And I remember looking out as the sun was setting and feeling this, this awesome silence. A great group of people were up there. And as is often true even when you go to the ocean and you watch a sunset, everything becomes very quiet. Now, for some, maybe that was just a a hike, a a two-and-a-half-hour hike. But for us, we felt the presence of God in that place and the presence of our friends and the sense of God's grace in that moment. You know, one of the things that most surprised me about my experience when I walked on the Camino, the Camino de Santiago, with Lisa, was how difficult it was for me to get any silence. Now, that really surprised me because, you know, I'd walk, I would watch the movie The Way with Martin Sheen, and I thought, oh, silence, that's just going to come with the whole thing. But we traveled with a group. We had two guides, two Spanish guides, and they traveled with us, and we were in a group. And I found it really, at times, frustrating that I couldn't get to any silence. And then I realized that it wasn't going to just happen for me. I had to grab it. I had to take hold of it. I had to choose it. And there was a moment when I just left the group and Lisa. <laughs> and I said, I'm sorry, I've got to, I'm going to take off. And I just, I went ahead and finally had this opportunity to center myself and to pray and, and feel you know, I was more contemplative and was able to, to pray out and think about the things that I wanted to pray about. But what I learned in that moment was there was a beautiful freedom in doing that. And I didn't, I, at first I thought I should feel guilty uh, for leaving the group. And then I realized that there was this tremendous blessing and that it was something I had to choose. And solitude and silence are an incredible blessing that we can choose because it's a place where God can speak to us in a unique way. And I want to say this, like Jebel Musa, or other spiritually important places for us, there is a mountain in which God wants to meet you. There is a mountain in which God wants to meet you. It may be your living room. It may be this sanctuary. 
It may be uh, a retreat center. It may be a walk along the marina or the ocean. I don't know where your mountain is, but God has a mountain where he wants to meet you. And I want to ask you, where is that quiet place that God can nourish your soul? You know, the worship leaders of our church, worship, our worship commission and I were talking, and we, as we were sharing about silence and talking about this, one of the things that um, came up was how we want the sanctuary to be a place of silence before worship begins. And I want to encourage you to do that. I want to encourage you to come into this place and really allow it to be a place of contemplation as you prepare for worship. I think silence can be so powerful as we come into the presence of God. As we walk through the wilderness, real quick, one more thing I want to say is that we have cause sincerely to rejoice. God gives Elijah a new assignment and a reason to hope, and he says, go return on your way. Let's read these last verses of this chapter. Verse 25, then the Lord said to him, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. Mm, Damascus. (laughs) When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael as king over Aram. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, of Ebel-Meholah, as prophet in your place. Now, I'm not going to go into any detail about any of that. But what I want to say to you is God had stuff for Elijah to do. That's the point. God had stuff for Elijah to do. All of God's people go through the wilderness, as I said. Abraham, Moses, Elijah, even the Son of God. Yeshua, Jesus, went into the wilderness, but the wilderness was not their destination. Their final destination was not the wilderness. Just as God calls Elisha to return home and anoint Hazael as king, so we have good works that have been prepared beforehand, as the Apostle Paul says, for us to do. There's good stuff that God wants to do in your life and in mine. And under that scrappy broom tree, Elijah would have never imagined that one day he was going to ride off in a fiery chariot to heaven. God still had things for Elisha to do. God still had grace and mercy and power and love to show through him and through his life. And I want to say no matter how much or how little you think you have accomplished, your story in God's kingdom is not over. Let's take a moment to pray about that in this moment of quiet contemplation. Let's pray this prayer of response. Lord of the wilderness road, you met your servant Elijah in a quiet place where he could experience your understanding, receive your practical help, hear your voice, and rejoice yet again. Be for us also companion on our journey, guide at the crossroads, breath in our weariness, protection in danger, home on the way, shelter on the road, 
shade in the heat, light in the darkness, comfort in our discouragement, and strength in our intentions, so that with your guidance and protection, we may arrive safe and well to the end of our pilgrimage, enriched with your gifts and full of your peace and joy through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen.